everyone. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a branch of Laurels, uh, a special Sunday edition of this morning. We have uh, Master Thomas and Dame Edith from Draft and Ball with us, and um, it's a special edition because of the time change uh, or the time difference between our two kingdoms. So, um, welcome. I uh, usually start this off uh, asking um, what your SCA origin story is, how you found the SCA, and um, what made you fall in love with it. So we have different stories, so I'll let uh, Edith start. Yeah, so I found the SCA in about 2006. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a rare I was a relatively rare beast in the SCA at the time in that I'm a native born British person <laughs> living in Britain. And uh, a lot of the SCA in the UK is uh, made up of people who have arrived in the UK from, from different parts of the world. <laughs> Lock up to my, my left here. And anyway, I was uh, unemployed. I was out of a job and I was quietly hunting. And my, po my boyfriend at the time, suggested that I have a look at uh, various reenactment and history groups around London because for various reasons some of my some of my friendship groups had changed so my social life had sort of dwindled a little bit and he said there's this group called the SCA which you probably haven't heard of and I went no and he said that they're an American group I think you'll like them anyway I had a hunt and it turned out there was a group in London and that group was called Thames Reach and I, I sent them an email and uh, this random person on the internet replied and said we're going to be in the pub tonight you should come and they gave me a name of a pub and I thought oh well, you know, I know that pub it was in central London just next to a tube station and I thought all right well you know what if it's a terrible evening all I've done is go into a pub in London that seems safe and um uh it turned out I I, <laughs> I arrived in this pub and there was just a group of people sitting around a table looking just like the group of people that I wanted to spend some time with. Um, it turned out the random bloke on the internet that had sent me an email uh, was a gentleman called uh, Robert of Canterbury, now Master Robert of Canterbury. And there was also, um, <laughs> well, I don't think he was, they don't think they were Duke and Duchess at the moment, at the time, but somebody who's now a couple, an Australian couple who've gone on to be king and queen of uh, Lock Ark and of Drakenwald and uh, they were viceroy of, of Insular Draconis for a while, and numerous other people who had turned into uh, pelicans and laurels and knights and so forth. And I kind of went from there, and it was great fun. So that, that's how I started. And I fell in love with it because um, one of the sites that you'll see later up, Winchester, I did, it was my first event, and I, I went to that, and I thought, this is the most amazing thing ever, because I get to do fun stuff in these beautiful buildings. And I was hooked. So it's a very different story for me. Uh, I go back to when the rocks were soft. And in about 1990, I was a, a fresh faced first year at university. And I, um, I joined all of the usual clubs as you do in Australia, um, you know, the science fiction fantasy book club and you know, found my people and one of the people, one of the groups that was in that people, and I hadn't realized it had only been formed about a year, was a shire, sorry, a college, and started to play, um, you know, learn what they were doing. And I'm like, they're wearing clothes, they're dressing up, this looks like fun. And then I heard that there was fighting and I managed to find my way across town to the other college because our college was the dancing college and the other college was the fighting college. So tracked across and and found a group of people that, as either said, were my people. Um, and as a result, I've had an SCA journey that is 31 years strong now, this year. And um, that's been in two kingdoms. Well, yeah, two kingdoms. The West, which was Lock Up, which and Lock Up was practically a kingdom on its own right at that point, but um, wasn't. And now Drakenwald. Um, and actually, I have a picture I'll show you, um, which tell, shows you the difference between uh, the Thomas that existed in Lockup, um, as you can see, a 21 year old there, um, wow. dressed in finest polyester and cotton. 
Um, and I was a very much a, a person that yeah liked to look good. That's about the only time I liked to look good, and who liked to to help a lot. And now you find an older Thomas who's learnt that well, Jacobold and European general's cold. So you kind of need wool, and you need fur, and also changed. You know, it was a, a different place. It was a place to grow. And like with all things and so I started to cook and um and found that camp cookery was a thing for me and that's predominantly what i do and i was very very lucky to come across a bunch of reenactors outside the sca uh, who were willing to teach me but very close to your context and we've got some pictures we'll show you with them later um and was able to grow and that's where my sca story really kicks off in terms of the the arts and and being a laurel and so is that I learned that actually this was something I was good at um, and I did and it's something that I really enjoyed and that the work around and then kicked on from there so I've grown it's a everything I do is different uh, and the SCA has been a really joyous place just to be me and to be supported being me and I'm glad to say that you know all the different things I've done in the SCA you know, my first meeting of the SCA was actually a heraldry meeting at somebody's house doing commentary. So, you know, changed, gone different ways. Um, and when you were in Lockock, uh, that was a pretty fancy costume. Were you doing your own costuming or did you have somebody that you got hooked oh, up with that sewed for you? Uh, not so, Well, I'd say I had a lot of help. Um, so that outfit was um, I had a I had an SCA event practically for my 21st birthday in my parents garage um, we did a feast <laughs> but a friend of mine um, helped me to make it I made that myself wow. um, apart from the hat she made me the hat and um, I've always liked the the bagpipe sleeve um, and that that's a 14th century but the 14th 15th century has just been the beauty you know, where I wanted to be and yeah, uh, I was very much helped by some university friends who said, yep, we can make that. And uh, they didn't just make it for me. They, they said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and um, I sewed it um, on my mother's sewing machine. Um, bless her. She didn't quite know what I was up to. And, you know, <laughs> was, was pleased that I did, she didn't need to help me because I think she was terrified of ever having to make a cod piece. <laughs> um and uh it went from there yeah so i've always made uh, a lot of my own clothes not much of this is actually um but i've made I, I do make my own things and i'm proud of it you know yeah that's, that's wonderful how about you um i am i am not one of nature's uh dressmakers um i i can i you know no I, I i'm quite good at squares and triangles but when it becomes fitted uh, so this dress I started and then our, our lovely friend, the lady Anne, saw me doing it and took it away with, from me and told me I was doing it badly. And, uh, and I rely on in Anne. A to, very loving in a, way. in a beautifully loving way, but I rely on Anne to do that because she's much better at it. My first kit was um, some terrible cheap uh, polyester that was uh, one pound a metre off uh, Walthamstow Market in East London. And, uh, and I made a tea tunic out of that. Uh, and it, fortunately, there are no surviving photos of me in it, so yay. Um, but so I, I like good clothes and I'm happy to help people make them for me, but I try not to make them myself because I don't do a good job of them. She undersells her skills quite no, significantly. No, 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 it's true. Um, but I think she makes an interesting point that I've, I've said about the SCA. I've done a lot of reenactment and I've done a lot of SCA and I love them both, but they're different beasts. And the beauty of the SCA is that low gatekeeping where you can come along with your attempt of pre 17th century dress. And no matter what it is, you know, um, trust me, I've seen it all. You can come and be part of a group. And I, I know I've seen a lot of things online about it and so on, but I find, I've always found it to be an encouraging, a welcoming group that, that grows people. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I started off in probably poly cotton because it's very hard to find wool in Australia, oddly. I, I never understood that. 40 million sheep and no wool to buy in the shops. Um, and, and, you know, went from there. And now you can see both of us in wool. It makes sense over here. 
uh, and linen yeah. and and some of that is to do with the cooking but we wouldn't be here if we hadn't started at the lower yeah end. yeah i mean yeah we wear wool because we also don't want to catch on fire around our campfire yeah <laughs> nobody we were... wants to melt into their costume <laughs> Uh, I, just the one rule of our of our camp kitchen is that no, uh, we love you dearly, but you can't work in the kitchen if you're wearing man-made fibres. What, um, what always is, surprises me is how well these clothes work for the British climate. Mm. And of course they should do because that's the climate they are designed to do. They are, they are designed to work for Northern European climates and that wool that keeps enough of the water out that you don't get wet immediately and so forth. And there's enough layers and it breathes and so forth. And it, in many ways it works much better than my our modern clothes mm. to, to do what it needs to do. And it's, it's an amazing going, yeah, of course they knew what they were doing. So early on, um, did each of you have uh, particular mentors that sort of took you under their wing and, and um, Early, early on, not early on. I mean, early on, yes. Um, and all the way through my SCA, even now, um, there are too many people to mention. I mean, you just, but at every stage, I've found that the SCA has had that person who's been able to, to work with you. And, you know, even today, there's the people I still work with. And, and um, I think even it goes both ways as well. I have two apprentices and uh, they mentor me in a way. You know, right. it's a journey through. But yes, there's been so many people. And there's a couple of pictures later on we'd like to, to show you of some desperately important people um, who have uh, have guided our, our SCA careers. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think for me, initially, it was uh, Duke Alaric of Bangor, who was one of the people sitting around that table in that pub. Um, uh, him and his wife, uh, Duchess Nerissa, had been lately arrived from Lock Ark into London. And they live quite close to me. And Alaric, um, he wasn't a laurel at the time, but he, he became a laurel for his cooking. And he was the person who said, I, you know, I always have always been interested in cooking. Uh, I, as I joined in my, my 30s, you know, I had a lot of skills and, you know, interests already developed. And he said, oh, oh you like cooking? And I said, yeah, 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 it's good. And he said, oh, right, well, let me, let's do cooking together. And it was his feasts that he involved me in and his events that he said oh you can come and in fact actually sure. <laughs> so i actually how i met thomas initially really in the first time um and this isn't romantically or this is no 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 no, no, no. this time is the we first came across, we came, came across each other in the sea um alaric had said oh i'm running this feast at this event you can come and help and i said absolutely not a problem and he was running it with thomas and uh uh i pitched up and uh this guy called Thomas, who was like, I don't know who you are. I don't trust you in my kitchen. You clearly don't know what you're doing. That's not what not I said quite. at all. Anyway, really he handed me like a, a 10 kilo bag of onions and said, these all need to be peeled and chopped. You know, please go away. I did give her a food processor as well. With a food processor, but you know, they all needed to be processed. And uh, so I, you know, I know these things need to happen in kitchens and I was happy to do it. And I went away and I, I processed all these onions and I came out and I encountered a friend who had, and I'd been, you know, crying and she was like oh my word what's happened to you i was like no no it's okay it's just onions but, but I, I looked like i'd sort of had some major disaster in my life because i'd spent two hours just just processing uh, onions but i think that proved i was happy to to do all the work that yes. needs to be done in a kitchen and and yeah you, you gradually worked your way through kitchens yes um and and yeah so so yeah so alaric and i in, Alaric involved me more and more in, in, in the various events and then he sort of helped me do my first feast and you know work through logistical planning and thinking about how feasts should be She's put together and uh, you know what worked well and how you know what you could achieve and not achieve and so forth and also the sort of start of research and things he bought yeah. me a, a few books initially which were, I was very very grateful for so I'd say Alaric initially and we we did eventually have a sort of a light laurel uh, apprentice relationship, uh, which was very much on the light touch, but it was very useful. And he's left back to lock up and missing dearly. We want him to come back to the okay. UK, but they're not going to. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, did you also end up apprenticing to somebody? I, I, I was never an apprentice, um, but what I would say is I've had two or three really strong friendships um, with 
in lockup with some people who then went on to become laurels. And I worked in kitchens in in Storm uh, Stormhold or Craigalas, which is the uh, group I helped found out there uh, for many many years and learnt vast quantities about how to run a kitchen, um, mainly from um, um, a lady who's going to kill me because I can remember her real name, but her SEA name has dribbled out my ears. Uh, and um, from from there, from the group of people um, there, such that when I first pitched up in Drakenwald, I was a bit cheeky. And I said, uh, oh, I can cook a feast. I know what I'm doing. I've never cooked a, a feast for more than 10 people before. I did 150 my first go in a medieval castle. And, it, you know, I had lots of really great help, uh, Mr. Skiriel and... Um, a few other people and we served up a really good feast in Kefili Castle um, for 150 odd people but that for me that's the SCA of well that's apprenticeship at its better at best um, is when you've absorbed the skills by just working with people over years that when you are in your first position it doesn't seem difficult it just you know um, and it probably helps that I'm an engineer in real life so you know, I have some, I have to organize projects. I have to know what I'm doing to, to keep things running and on time. Um, but I, I yes, uh, those sorts of things. Are, Elspeth Kerwent, that's her name. Hey. <laughs> um, and the brain works. Yes, it, 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 it's a Sunday afternoon. Um, and I'm getting older. <laughs> and, and honestly, I think it happens to everybody. It happens to me all the time. It's happened to everyone that I've interviewed we've gotten, it's been a year, you know, and we're, we're used to yeah. seeing each other's um, mundane names mm -hmm. on the internet and uh, everybody's going to have to afford each other some grace uh, <laughs> over name usage for a while, I think. I think so. Um, actually, speaking of mundane names, I should say that there's one person really with, who is responsible for me and uh, cooking at all in the SCA, certainly camp cooking. Um, is a lady named, not again. <laughs> I'm not sure who, who are we talking about? Caroline. Caroline a lady Yeldon. named Caroline Yeldon, who sadly passed away a few, a few years ago. Uh, but she is a, she's been on television a couple of times. She's a reenactor um, and a food historian, uh, worked for Durham University, uh, and was one of, was the key person who took me from someone who was really keen and sort of could cook to someone who knew how to run a fire, to someone who spit roasted, to someone who could just, you know, work over a fire and do medieval research as well. Um, without Caroline, there would be no Thomas, as I am, you know, Thomas looking in that picture. Yeah. Um, because, um, and, and she's helped us as yeah, well. Yeah, and she um, helped myself. I mean, Caroline, uh, was um, involved in the Kentwell reenactment, annual reenactment at Kentwell, which is a very, very famous uh, Tudor reenactment that happens, well, normally happens every year in England and has been run for, for many decades. Mm. And it is the premier level of reenactment yeah. in the UK. And uh, she ran the kitchens there for a number of years. And so she really knew her stuff in a way that I yeah. don't even vaguely so, get to in, in our, my knowledge. Yeah. And she was just lovely. And again, and I think for me, Went she's way the, too early. Yeah, the closest I've ever had to an apprenticeship is working with her. Yeah. Um, and she took us to some, I took me certainly to some really interesting places uh, working for uh, Welsh Heritage, um, not so much English Heritage, but certainly Cadu. Yeah. And the National we got Trust. To, National Trust. But we got to go to, you know, Chitao, which we'll, we'll show you some pictures of later, which is a beautiful 15th century manor house that still has its kitchen and feasting hall. It's just lovely. Oh, so there's some photos of that. We'll yeah. get to that. But let's yeah. go ahead and, and start going through um, some of the photos. So, if we'll take you to some key locations. So Edith mentioned the um, um, her special place, and I'll yeah. talk about so this. So this is St Cross, uh, the Hospital of St Cross in Winchester. Uh, it's um, was founded by King Stephen. So we're going into the 1100s here yeah. as a uh, poor uh arms house for local men in winchester who were down on their luck who were elderly and needed somewhere to live but of good character but of good character mm -hmm. and then that was augmented uh by uh henry the fourth uh and um 
it is now uh, still established in marriage survival dissolution because it wasn't a formal uh, religious society but it still looks after I think about 20 elderly yep. men of the local area and you can see here there's a beautiful church and uh, some Tudor buildings and uh, the where all those um, uh, chimneys are are the houses that are, these elderly men live at and they have uh, a beautiful uh, medieval hall with a central fireplace uh, and a dais and uh, for a very long time they've allowed us when possible to come and use their facilities yeah. we do demos for them as well and um, we have an event called the Winchester pilgrimage where we walk into Winchester town which is about two miles down the road um, and we go on pilgrimage to it and this was the first event I ever attended and um, you can imagine it. and actually this is I think a photo from probably that first or even that second event and if we could go to the next photo um, this is the view uh, through a doorway and on that first event I woke up early in the morning and I had been sleeping in that building and I came down those stairs to find this idyllic scene that I was managing to experience at sort of 7 a.m. in the morning as the sun was rising and there was uh, cows in the meadow behind that fence and there was pavilions in that but on that grass and I just thought well I think we found where we want to be don't we and it was just beautiful and I've, 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 I've loved this place ever since and I've cooked there now numerous times we've cooked feasts there we've done uh, little events there and it's just glorious and the men who still live there are lovely as well yes. they just think uh, they was, think we're great when we turn up and we feed was, them and everything I was uh, spit roasting a a joint of beef I think and yeah. I sat out on the grass in the sun and um the 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 the, the gentleman would file past and start talking to me and then it was a, it was a Sunday afternoon and enough, uh, well yes being being England um the most important topic was the cricket and there was a test against uh, Australia and they they spent quite a lot of time coming out to give me reports on what the score was um and, and as you understand cricket is a, is a sport that takes a long time and you know, don't expect <laughs> you to understand it, but it develops over a long period. And it, but it was just a beautifully relaxed, I sat there. Turning a spitty is one of the, one of the most mesmeric meditative things that I, I, I find. And it's one of the beauties of cooking yeah. I find is to sit there and just gradually turn the spit and you sort of can't do it fast, you have to do it slow. And then to be chatting away with some gentlemen and they were all wearing their fine, um, very academic looking gowns that they get to wear. And they were having a great time. We were having a great time. And it was just the SEA at its best. Yeah. And then yeah. later on that evening, he set the fire alarm off. Yes, I did set the fire alarm <laughs> To be fair, it was the only time I cooked on modern cooking equipment and I set the fire alarm off. We were frying some asparagus. I'd been cooking in the, their main kitchen all day. And uh, yes, that was, that was, that was a moment. <laughs> But yeah, so if we could do... Uh, That's so then, practical to be able to have those transportive I know, moments. it's just... And, and, and I will say, in Drakovog, we are we know we are so lucky that we have these places. Um, but I know from my time in Lokak um, that that you can have equally, you know, special times. Uh, Roni Festival I've been to, that was just beautiful. Um, and... Um, many other events I've been to, even in you know, more modern settings, but that piece, that community is the beauty of it. Yes. Yeah. So um, if you get a chance to come back to the, if people come, when travel is loud, yeah. Winchester, the um, St. Cross is beautiful. Uh, we talked about doing a demonstration for them. Um, and one of the things that I've been really lucky to be able to do is to make a pie oven, which I think is quite appropriate for today, given it's March the 14th. <laughs> um, day. I'm sorry, math the mathematician in me couldn't help get that joke out. Um, <laughs> but as you can see here, the, um, these are, well, that's Mark 1 of our oven. Um, and wow. the, um, it's instead of being, it should be wattle and daub, which is um, a mixture of clay, horse manure and straw. Uh, but that doesn't last very long in a car if you start taking it around. And people also get a bit funny about manure. cooking pies in that. <laughs> perfectly safe but you know uh but this is the outside of this is plaster and we made the mistake of letting it get slightly damp and then what happens when you heat it up is that the moisture 
expands and causes cracks. So we now have Mark II, which is a lot more secure than this, but we did manage to make some fairly creditable pies yeah, that day yeah. and there's some pictures later on. Yeah. But this is us doing a food demonstration um, for, for, their, for, for their Michaelmas. Yeah, it yeah. was for their general, they had a, a, a day yeah. for the general public and, and as a sort of, a t you know, kind of a way for us to, way say, for us to use the site a late, at a later site, date yeah. and things. So, yes, you'll, you'll find most of our photos, we are looking grubby and dirty and cooking because we've all got our cook's yeah. kit on. Uh, so, but yeah, there is a little pie down there in the bottom right hand corner, which we did make uh, mm -hmm. in that day. And uh, um, and it was, uh, yes, it's it, it it's looks real. Nice with grubby clothes. I mean, it looks fantastic. So I, uh, do you have process photos of your pie oven on the internet anywhere? Um, I have a, uh, I do actually have a document on my website um, and I can send you the link to that to, to, to put up if you want. That would um, be lovely. I have a, a, a close friend here in Ontario, um, Eulalia Pie Baker, who is very into pie making. And I think that, uh, and she's been uh, a, I'm yeah. not sure what the term is. She's been getting clay out of her own soil and doing uh, clay wow. fire pottery wow. in her yard well, during the I, pandemic. And this would just make her so happy. <laughs> I have a documentation, uh, a, doc a document. I entered this into a, uh, one of our Kingdom Arts and Sciences competition with a full documentation um, document. So, uh, and that's up on our, our uh, shared website. So I can send you that link. Um, what I would say is we are lucky here. We have a, you can see there's some green pottery floating around we have this is made by a man called Jim the Pot who's a supplier to the reenactment community and the liner for our oven is made um, by him as a ceramic liner that makes it a lot easier to build the oven nice. um, but that said I've, I've posited some ideas as to how you would actually build it if you were making it out of um, um, mud and I know a couple of people in lockup who've done it so I can probably point her at that as well if she needs some help but he does cook lovely pies but it, it, it's yeah it does it's finickety but it and, and bread loads as well and bread yes we've done bread, bread in it as yeah. well yeah. um very cool but but we make the point that we cooks not bakers so yes. we make pies not bread yeah <laughs> um <laughs> and, and yeah here's another picture of and that's of, just the the demo that we were attending yeah. that day so that's just they had a whole lot of different stalls the our bit was a very small bit of it but we were doing some fighting that day uh, they uh, and, were and entertaining you, the children crucially you can see the other side of the quad so that archway is uh, was where i took that other photo from looking out and and, and, and it leads into their the, um 15th century medieval hall and when we have events there we feast yeah. in the 15th century and, hall I was lucky enough to be at the first of these events um, way back in the day, and it was um, uh, it was actually a, a, the the brainchild of a very illustrious and now sadly departed SCA member, Terra Fund, um, Master Terra Fund, and uh, he was chatting away with the master, and uh, who, he was the, the gentleman who runs the whole establishment. He's the local vicar, and he pointed at the the table that was in the corner and uh, had our bread all over it and it was just sitting there and uh, he said um, yes that's a very interesting table yes king stephen gave us that table it's 900 years old 800 years <laughs> old and we said well, we've got things on it and they said it's a table uh, it's a table to be used now subsequently it has been taken down and put up on the wall and it's a display piece but <laughs> just odd occasionally very odd things beautiful <laughs> things happen to you so you know yeah Wow, that's amazing. So, so yeah, Winchester is is very dear, and in fact, actually, one of the key feasts I ran there. Uh, there's a book of 15th century cookery uh, that has some extant uh, menus in it, um, and I took one of the more simpler of those and I recreated it at that site, and I did my darndest to do it 100% correct. And the nice thing about it was that we did the entire feast. Um, uh, in a building, and these these menus were probably for Henry the Fourth himself, and uh, his brother Cardinal Beaufort, his 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 half brother Cardinal Beaufort, uh, founded uh, both the extra bits of these buildings and also a lot of uh, Winchester because he had been Bishop of Winchester. Yeah. He updated the cathedral and so forth. So Henry and his brother, uh, Cardinal Beaufort, are very, very closely linked to this one. And it was joy to cook a menu that has been designed for Henry IV 
in a building that he would have known and in a building that his brother would have known and that was just amazing and i think this is the aforementioned roast that there. was the roast with the, yes um yeah um uh, I've, I've taken a break clearly at that point yes that <laughs> happens um but uh, you can see that the key features here is that turning the spit is the most important job so that's why i'm the only cook doing it but also you need a drink at all times when doing that do not spit roast without a drink that's an important safety tip for everybody involved. <laughs> for sure. Um, then another key site, which is one that this very nice lady found, is the next slide we have. Yeah. So uh, this is a really special place to, to eat. Yeah. This. So um, this is St. Ethelburga's Church, uh, which is in London. When I joined uh, the SEA, Thames Reach, uh, which was the London group, uh, also occasionally known as uh, Lockhart upon Thames. Um, was uh, hadn't managed to hold an event within the main area of London because sites were incredibly difficult to find and, and incredibly hard. Uh, and if you could get them, they were just exorbitantly expensive. Anyway, I found this little church that had uh, been bombed a few years before and then rebuilt as a uh, sort of a conference center. So it was available for us to use and it is in the old city of London. It is um, on Bishopsgate and uh, within the balls of, of what was the medieval town. And this was one of the uh, older medieval buildings. You can see quite a lot of reconstruction has been had on it, but we found it and we were able to use it for three or four years. This is one of the later events uh, there. And we had, uh, we they were only day events because um, there was no place to, to accommodate anybody. Uh, but we did, we would have a little sort of buffet feast and uh, um, a dancing event and it would run through the afternoon into the evening and uh, it was a real joy to be able to do something where it, were, it felt really local, nobody had to get on in a car, nobody had to, you know, if we were in London, some people came in from town but, you know, the Londoners could just, you know, get there in the same way that they would normally do and as a result it was just lovely to hold and uh yeah. it's a place that has many memories unfortunately we don't it's not used anymore because it's 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 got a little bit out of that price range but um uh it was it was fun to use and a uh, couple of old grady photos but i think you can see this the, the, the niceness of this building it's beautiful yeah so next is a place that well is without compare this is our this is into the Deconus' spiritual home. Yes, Inter this is Deconus Ranger is, Castle. Is the UK, Ireland and Iceland. Yeah. I think that's everybody. Um, and um, Raglan started 16 years ago yeah, I think we're at Raglan as a small weekend event and has grown and grown and is now a 10 day long camping event. Wow. Just, just over a, um, you know, two weekends in a week um, in a medieval castle. Um, and we've grown with it. Uh, my camp cookery has grown with it. This is the place that where we run a kitchen for 10 days solid. And uh, I can tell you, if you if you really want to get your abs uh, and core muscles absolutely working, you have to haul water in buckets. Yeah, there's no running water on the site. Oh, there is running water on the site. The, 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 the taps, tap. taps are, you know, a, a long way from where you are in camp. And so you walk. And you carry water and you, you get very good at water management and you get very good at uh, keeping an idea of where the firewood is and you know you have to manage all of those things and we run a kitchen there and a, an encampment um, which uh, is, is, is is coming up but this rag and castle uh, they fight a, a battle through the castle we're very very careful we don't touch the castle in any way um, and uh, there's a there's a bridge off to the left you can see in this picture, um, and that bridge is um, the the site of a of an of an annual battle of a uh, you know a battle over to take the bridge, and it's one of the most magical things I fought in that, and I fought through that gatehouse in the days before I retired, and this is our event that we get to do our thing, um, and as part of that um, we have a household. Well, that sort of forms just for this event. Uh, yes, um, they're, fr they're our friends. It's a same yeah, semi which is under group. the bridge. So when we first came to Raglan, I first came to Raglan, I've been to every single Raglan at least 
uh, for a couple of hours. <laughs> um, there's a couple I've had a rest on, but um, I came at least for a couple of hours. Um, and the first raglan, uh, I cooked one meal. The second raglan, I think I cooked two or three. Um, we now have uh, this site. So we moved around a little bit as everything settled in the first few years. We're now under the bridge. Now, what you can see here is what we wake up to. Yeah, this is this is early morning. Um, uh, looking out onto the moat, our pavilions are behind us, yes. effectively in the that photo. Um, and this is our dining room. Yeah. So there are two arches next to each other, um, and um, uh, those two arches we use one for dining in, which is why it's got the nice table in, and the other is our kitchen, which we'll get to in a minute. And the booze from the night. Um, we don't leave sight so you know yeah. um and we kind of set up you know a, a community of people that have worked and people come and cook with us people come and dine with us people come and learn how to work in the fire and it and it's inspired another three or four camps i think yeah um, um to, to grow their setups and you know there's a bit of competition but healthy competition goes on between <laughs> everybody acquiring new things um, yes. Our entire our, our house here uh, yeah, in the West Country stuff. is gets emptied. Yeah, and my mother wanders comes in when she comes to visit. Oh, there's so much stuff in your house, and mm. and then uh, and then we do and then and then when, when we go to Raglan, my house looks like a, a regular person's house because all the extra stuff mm. the comes out of it. Crockery. <laughs> I, don't see yeah. I just have double. Um, it's fine, Mum. She, what are you it, complaining about? Here's a better picture of the bridge that the battle is fought on. Um, yeah. Uh, so. So um, whereas the previous one, it was uh, round to the right. right. This, this, yeah, the moat is flowing uh, underneath. underneath flowing. There. Yeah, well, um, it's sort of flowing. It doesn't really flow, as a gentleman found out when um, he had a uh, lanyard failure on his sword and it, on my sword, I should say. <laughs> he put it on, but anyway, he was borrowing it, and it flew into the moat, and he had to swim to yeah. there to get it back because. <laughs> Yes, and there's actually I didn't we didn't include that, but there are various photos of various people leaning over edges of walls with things on long sticks and hooks to we try and extract fish things out stuff of the moat. that's um, fallen in. But you know the, the, the engineers on site, um, and here this next uh, and this, this site is actually from photo this taken. is our kitchen. Yeah, so this is taken from um, the from that bridge. Yeah. Um, and you can see the other arch that we're underneath uh, and some of the kit that we've got going. Yeah. Uh, there's some better photos of all that, but this uh, shade. Uh, so North South Wales, even in August, uh, can get wet. <laughs> and one of the uh, rainiest places in Britain and Britain's one uh, of the rainiest can also places get, I know of. So. Um, <laughs> windy and it can also get very sunny. sunny so the shade that we built has helped some yes. of the, uh, the weather management that's oh, four or five years old yeah I, I finally got tired of uh, again co uh, cooking in the rain um because the fire doesn't go out if you manage it properly but it gets boring you get very well um and you get wet um so yeah we bought a piece of canvas and i built i designed and built a, a structure that can go over there um we've got to the point now where we do take a trailer or a uh, large lorry um, to site. Um, you can also see one of my other fun little toys, which is a Glastonbury chair, the blue chair. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's the influence of Master Terrafan. Um, Terrafan Grey Dragon, you can find his the patterns for his furniture um, on greydragon.org. I think it's still there. Um, and you can see that there's uh, a fire in the middle, which takes over. We now have two fire pits because of course all of these things are crete um yes. and what happens is that we we go to a raglan and we go oh do you know what it'd be very handy if we were oh do you know next year next, next year we're year. gonna have a screen so that we don't try and to, we're not and trying then, to cook oh, an entire pig in a wind tunnel next year um, we'll bring an extra table or do you know actually a cupboard would be nice um one year we had managed to buy a piece of reproduction furniture cheaply at a local auction house so um a fake the Elizabethan court cabinet yeah, came with us one year. Yeah. That was only one year. <laughs> it didn't come with us again. It's, it's in our kitchen very happily. But it was it's a terrible, 
it's terrible infliction which we we spread to our friends um uh, my, uh lord simon has gone has he's one who's one of our friends who comes with us was like oh do you know what shelves and the following year he turned up with some shelves, shelves. and uh, you can also <laughs> see off to the right there's two ceramic um covers oh uh-huh and they're yeah, curfews point that out. um I and then if you can that. see the mouse pointer but the curfews um, are for covering the fire. Because one of the perennial things that would happen is uh, there'd be a fire and we'd be chatting away into the small hours, you know, as you do. And I'd be like, I really want to get a bed, but I can't let the fire, the fire's too big. Um, and what you just do is scrape the fire up into a small heap. You put a curfew over the top. And then the next morning, if you're lucky, most of the time this happens, you can take the curfew off and blow on the coals put the, some, some kindling on and away it goes. Wow. Um, they are very, very useful. And it comes from the French curfew, just means to cover the fire. Um, and so that's a, a, a useful uh, part of our camps that, again, we couldn't do without. And then on the left, you can see some boxes and that's where we cover our very... Uh, um, we have mundane stuff. That mundane um, ice boxes, do you call them? Yeah, I have to be careful what I call them. The Australians call them something socially unacceptable. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm afraid to say, you know, we can keep our meat in there. We keep our meat in there, but we make some wooden boxes to cover it. Yeah. And again, this, I think this comes down to, again, what I think the SCA is great at is that because you can build things up and get more authentic as you go, and you don't need to be perfect from the start, the gatekeeping is low. So we've grown. Yeah. This, our, this um, gone our encampment from something quite simple um, to something more authentic and something bigger. But you don't need any of it, but at the same time, it's fun if it's there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so if we go to the next then, image. The ne so oh. here you can see our dining. Uh, we pulled it out of the dining room because, of course, for once, it's not actually raining. And, and what we do do, at Raglan, is we eat at the right times. Yes. So we have our main meal at lunchtime, generally about one o'clock, 1.30. And then we don't try and cook in the dark. Uh, to try and cook in the dark is a way of getting- uh, Or even wash up in the dark. Or even wash up in the dark. It's an excellent way of getting food poisoning very, very quickly. So uh, we keep medieval hours. We do have a little bit of breakfast, uh, you know, for those of us who need coffee and, and, and so forth. Uh, but we have our main meal. This is, uh, most of our group, uh, there's a few others. There's uh, Dame Lunette, who, who you uh, interviewed and, and, uh, and spoke agent. to, um, and uh, uh, various other individuals. And uh, I can only apologise about the beard. In that and I can only apologise about the glasses. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is quite, a, and, and, I, and I say, this is a simple uh, layout for us. Uh, it's probably it's only about meals, yeah. eight or ten dishes. When we're really going out and we're feeding 15 to 20, we will have a lot more on the on the form but as you can see we dine incredibly well Very it lucky. takes a lot of hard work and uh, you have to contribute to the camp uh, if you you either have to help in the kitchen or you have to do the washing up or you have to be the wood chopper i'm not the wood chopper no. otherwise i would have no fingers uh that's master master robert who's the the guy in white in the bottom left hand corner um and uh you know we don't do too badly yeah we don't do too badly and we do think nice things like on a Friday, we'll do fish. Um, just as an experiment, we'll do a fish day and see how we go. And that's the beauty of a 10 day event is you can work your way through lots of different ideas. Yeah. And we try to stick mainly to the 15th century, but that's because that's what I know. That's the recipes I'm really comfortable with. And when you're working um, sometimes in high winds, yeah. um, we were we were talking with somebody who was a professional chef at one point and the wind was up, we were outside and I sort of was like, right, I need to make some pastry and just made some pastry. And he sort of looked at me and sort of said, you people are insane. What he doesn't say is that that was my brother. <laughs> I don't want to call him out. <laughs> but um, what it, the, the niceness of a 10 day event means that you can try things over a, a longer period of time. Mm. If, if something needs a soak for three or four days, oranges. if, uh, you know, so there's a preserved orange recipe from the uh, 16th century and, you know, boiling sugar over a, over a fire, that's an interesting thing to do and it requires some time and it requires space. And this rhythm of this event mm. allows you to, to see what works 
and see what doesn't work and what work, you know uh, and there are dishes that we do again and again and again and we're, we're known yeah. for doing but there we, tr we we do try if we don't do them and do them every year and uh you know it's it's something that we're immensely proud that we're mm. able to do yeah it's but, uh Yes, the, 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 if we don't do Norwegian pastries, we're getting yeah. in a lot of trouble. And here you can see, actually, the next one, this is a, this is a, a better good view, of, the, the... view of our actual setup. Um, you can see the curfew at the bottom there. Um, that screen to the left is a necessary piece of equipment in the Welsh countryside. Um, you can't keep a fire. You can keep a fire, but it's really hard to keep a fire going at a decent heat. In a wind tunnel. Uh, in a wind tunnel. Um, and... <laughs> Um, I mean, I've been very lucky to been able to acquire the uh, the steel work and talk to people about it over the years uh, and gradually can, build it up. You can see we've got our water pot there mm, and, uh, you know, all hand -washing our, 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 you know, our green crockery and the fire and the hooks and the bellows and the spits and so forth. So so we can do. We can feed 25, I think, over this. We happily feed 25 over this down yeah. in, um, down in, in, in the, uh, um, uh, in, in, in Wales. And you can see here's us with our pots going. Yes, um, I'm not quite sure what I'm, we're making, but uh, there's be something going like on. chicken, I think. It may be chicken. Yeah. Um, and, uh, oh, you can even see a sneaky bottle of wine being, uh, being, uh, chilled. <laughs> in the, in the, bucket. Uh, the fire buckets you've got to keep the standards the fire up. buckets do great work we wouldn't go anywhere without a fire bucket um but they can be used to chill wine as well um, and actually it's quite good you can see how the how that moat curves around yeah. from that first so photo so. all ground and there's a big bowling green up at the top of that wall um which uh, was part of the 16th century folly for the site um and uh, that's where the majority of the camp is we kind of tucked away in our little little world, which is fine with us, we're, yeah. we're quite happy. We get quite a lot of people come through, and you know, really happy to chat to people. Uh, we'll talk about cookery all day. Oh yeah, absolutely. We? So, yeah. Um, as we're proving, um, <laughs> and uh, there's another picture actually. Yeah, yeah. So you can see we've had the oven <laughs> set up on the side there. This is a few years before the yeah. cover. Um, and there's it's quite a good shot of the, uh, the the chairs there. Yeah. Um, and oh yeah, there's there's us dining in slightly less clement weather, uh, and uh, that does look like some that is some uh, pork, I think that's pork, pork. I think. yeah, pork or beef, and it is more cooked than it looks. Trust me, that actually might be the beef. I think that is beef actually. Yeah. It's rare. Um, oh, that's and, that's uh, me being a herald, and that's just to prove that he can do clean at Raglan as yeah, well. Yeah, I can do clean at Raglan. I wash <laughs> up, you know. But um, uh, yeah. It's, a, a, you know, if you speak to anybody in ID, uh, they will rave about how fantastic Raglan is. And in fact, you know, it, Raglan is now an established part of the sort of Drakenwald, you know, calendar. calendar. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we've had people from all over the known world come because, you know, to fight, to live, to exist in a castle, mm. even a ruined one is, is an, a magical and amazing mm. thing to do. Um, these are photos of a bit more of the photos of the oven in action and uh, and and the pie. Uh, this is our friend uh, Eggbold, uh, and it's just you can see how it uh, integrates into our cooking. What we realised is actually you can't do oven cooking and campfire cooking uh, at the same time. You have to have somebody looking after the oven and somebody looking after the fire of the of the camp. It's not feasible to try and do both at the same yeah, time because they require different oh. levels of attention at different times yeah. Yeah. and it's very difficult to manage it otherwise so if uh, thomas is doing over the fire stuff i can i can do the pie oven because yeah. pastry is my thing and, and then you'll need someone else organizing uh, yeah the salads and the, and, the, and, the cold. because we have we're really lucky we have a, a big range of people who like to come and take part and like to cook yes we've trained um, up a number of people yeah um <laughs> And uh, I think our, one of our more famous dishes is on the left there. Yeah. The Norwegian pasties. Now, they've become a bit legendary and they sound possibly the most disgusting thing. They are in plain delight. You can look them up, pasties nourice. But they're cream cheese, pine nuts, raisins, and smoked fish made into a, a filling, wrapped in pastry and fried. Like a samosa. Like a samosa or um, a, a parcel. Uh, we like to fry them in lard because it's really high temperature and crispy, but it's not always uh, 
very good for everybody to do that. So we, we will cook them in other, it can be cooked in other things. But what we've found is they're one of the more Moorish things you can eat. They just you just can't eat one. You keep eating them. Um, and um, I fed them to to non medieval interested type people, uh, and they can't get enough of them either. So I highly recommend. They yes. sound weird, but they are absolutely the sweetness, the texture, the smokiness balances. Um, we found smoked mackerel would yeah. be our favourite. Yeah, that works well. Um, but uh, lots of different choices. And the pie? What's and the pie. pie. Do you know, I think that was a chicken pie. Um, right. uh, we're holding it on the plates in the middle photo and down at the bottom. That's how it came out. Uh, uh, just to show you can get very nicely cooked pies mm. out of these very sort of rudimentary mm. ovens. Um, quite still one of the best tartan embedos I've ever cooked came out of one of these ovens and it's yeah. just risen yeah. and gone all fluffy. So and, uh, um, it's, it's, it is possible to produce really, really good high quality yeah. food from them, but you mm. do have to pay attention. Yes. Uh, so yes. Uh, what's next? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So this is what we talk about when we talk about hiding stuff. This hides my cool box and it's made from an Ikea bed. Um, oh, so it just okay. proves, and a bit of plywood, so it just proves you can, you know, and it passes muster and it hides away in the corner. Uh, and I just really wanted to make the point that I'm not the best woodworker in the world, but I can make that. Um, you just cut some timber up and nail it together, you yeah. know, screw it together and it's, that's fine. Um, that's it. I do like to, I do have a, a, a little bit of a, a secret hobby. I'm a wood turner, um, mainly with power turning, but Again, this is another example of don't let authenticity be a gatekeeper. Um, this is my lathe that is literally constructed from bits of random timber I had floating around and a bit of rope and then a pole. Um, and it was really just an excuse to have some fun and work and, and try it um, and give myself something to do in the afternoons other than cook when I was at Raglan's. Again, this is a Raglan's hiding behind our tent because it wasn't the most authentic thing. Um, and so, you know, I've turned nothing much off that one, but I have used my power lathe to make some stuff for the SEO. So on the right there, you can see the lance handle um, that I've made for uh, for the for SEA um, poly jousting, if you like, um, which is why it has, and now has a wooden handle, a wooden part in it. It's got uh, PVC, it was an experiment. Um, and then there's also a couple of nicer pieces that I've made. So there's a needle case on the left just copied off a Roman one, I think, mm, but yeah. I couldn't find any medieval ones. And then just a random plate that I've made. So um, just a little side hobby. I don't just cook, I do other things. Yes, but, we all, uh, there are other things, other things to do. <laughs> now this is Tratara coming up. Our next site, this is, Raglan is our spiritual home, but this is the cathedral. This <laughs> is the place, this wow. is the place where I think I've cooked the best food I've ever cooked. Yes, we've absolutely. We've cooked the best food yeah. we've ever cooked. Um, so this is a uh, 15th century uh, manor house. Quite a, quite a quite a low-key one. This is in the middle of the Brecon Beacons in uh, South Wales. And uh, it's, it's not it's very fancy. It's not, you know, a major manor house. The people who would have lived here would have been minor gentry. Uh, they're, they upgraded to this house. Uh, on the other side of that lawn is their castle, which mm, they abandoned sure and, for, for, and took some of the stone and made this much nicer, warmer, you know, places when they didn't think they were going to start uh, being uh, attacked. And uh, for many, many years, it was a barn and uh, just a farm building. Um, and it was taken over by Welsh Heritage a number of years ago, and they've slowly been restoring it. And it's now uh used by uh welsh heritage as an example of what these buildings would have looked like yes. within period so they have reinstated walls and reinstated ceilings and uh you can see down here on the bottom they you know they have decorated the dining hall uh the, the main hall as it would have been at its height of um occupancy in, in about the 15th century in about the, the the mid to late 15th century and uh because of that they have a functioning kitchen and um, uh, Tratara also turns up rather randomly on some terrible sci-fi films yeah. as well. So you do occasionally see it, and it's sort of there's a witch fantasy yeah. thing that it turns up on. Is yeah. one of the locations? Um, <laughs> and a, uh, a very bad Johnny Depp film, which is responsible why their um, their uh, balcony there on the right is not white anymore. 
Uh, there was something about the fire of London, I don't remember, but okay. it's, it's permanently know. beige as a result. So um, they have a functioning kitchen with yep. a functioning half and a functioning uh, a set of tables, set of tables things and things, Every, want. everything you want. So you can just turn up, we, we bring our spits and our ironmongery, uh, but you know, they allow us to use their tables and, and bits and pieces. And um, Thomas's highlight from this uh, place, not this event, but a, a, another one was where we did an entire 15th century meal. Yeah, so this is us doing 16th century, but um, we did in that, in the previous slide, you saw there was a dining hall. We did a, a 15th century meal for about 50, 55 people. people yeah. Um, out of this kitchen, which is, it's extensive kitchen, but it's not, it's not massive. Yeah. And uh, a, a full SEA feast. So, but three a, courses, crucially, X number of people. we managed to get people to eat at one o'clock in the afternoon yeah. because they were going to kick us out at four. Um, and um, we did classes on etiquette and, and, you know, how to eat a medieval meal and then served it as best we could to a, to a, a menu we could find that would, would work with, you know, the right order of dishes. Uh, and I think there was probably what six of us in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was um, an exhausting day. Was, but, I was, uh, I was a, a wreck afterwards. I fell over and had to be carried <laughs> to my tent. But um, this is, uh, but this is a place that has a long history with me. This is where I met um, Caroline, um, who I mentioned earlier. And there's also a gentleman you can see there in just behind the lady with the veil. That's you, isn't it? No, it's no, not. It's not, it's not it's somewhere else. Uh, but just behind it is Master Paul um who i still work with today um and um but i met them in reenactment circles and we worked and we worked and we learned recipes we learned to cook and i learned to drive this um fireplace such that you know cadu would let us use it and just work there yeah because i'd worked with the right people um they felt that you know it was it was it was okay we know the caretaker of this site by first name um you know yeah. still remembers they haven't been for a few years because of all sorts of things but you know we turn up and it'll be oh how are you doing you know um unfortunately he still calls me tom which i don't like but you know uh, <laughs> and, and i can forgive him it, the setting and this the, this beautiful house in mm. this beautiful location is it's really magical uh so there's there's lady anne uh you know helping um and uh and we've we're cooking i think probably some pottage at this point and we're getting bits and pieces off the fire some to mushrooms serve. being fried on the left and uh you know you can see what a functional fireplace this is and, and how you would use it uh you know to produce the the food that would have been done at the time and you know how we've managed to to produce it as well and we've and, spit roasted in front of it we've put pots on top of it you, it's amazing how much you can get around it yeah um, what we do find is if we cook there two days in a row it's much easier to light the fire the second day because the hearth is warm which was something that i i wouldn't have thought about until i sort of you know that keeping the um keeping the stones warm even overnight just so that you don't bring them up as much because there's a lot of thermal mass in that that stove but once it gets going you can keep cooking yeah. on there with very little firewood um, and um, the efficiency of this over our Raglan setup is it's, it's amazing yeah. to, to see just how little we need to, to, to cook for that many people. Both both um, Tratau and Raglan are owned by CADU, yeah. which is which is Welsh Heritage, which is a government uh, body that looks after ancient buildings. And uh, as a result, they're all open to the public, and they're always open to the public when we are visiting. Mm. So we do get the the fantastic standard selection of "ew, you're not cooking that," and "oh, what you know." Is that oh, a real fire? Oh, you know, as so you, you kind of fish them back out again. You know, um, so we get all the standard stuff, mm. but we we're quite good at sort of interacting with the public as a result because we've we've done it for, yeah. for years we, we've got we a can... sixth sense so when they're at set themselves on fire <laughs> you but, tell them what um, things are and stuff. i'm just having a look at what have we got here i'm we've not got, sure but they look tasty got, uh, i think they're um i think they're the the fluffy pancakes they could well be fritters uh, yes. which are fritters which are a pancake batter enriched with yeast and left to uh to go yeah. and then fried um, well, i think there's a fruit tree at the back there fruit tree at the back and i think fried carrots at the front yeah and then got a salad and a green sauce and a bit of gingerbread. And, and what I, I can see there is that's a Master Paul salad, isn't it? It is a Master Paul salad. Uh, Master Paul, we mentioned earlier, uh, is, is brilliant at dressing these salads. And, you know, you'll find little fish cut out of carrots. Yes. You'll find, um, he, um, 
we did a birthday party at Ragland for, for one of the, the, the members and uh, he'd been making benches for the whole weekend and the entirety of the salad had little benches made out of carrots all over <laughs> it as a birthday celebration. Yes. It was brilliant. Um, um, I think there's some wafers there in front of it yes. and a stew or a pottage. Yeah. So, you know, you can see a uh, little variety of bits and pieces of the food that we can, we oh, can yes. cook from. And, we've, done, uh, we've got a wafer iron that we can put in the fire and, uh, you know, cook very thin proto waffles. And also, um, I think this shows quite how attractive medieval food can be. Mm. I think there's a, I think there's, I think for various reasons, medieval food has a bad reputation, both in and out of the SEA, that it's sort of grey sludge and, oh, my word, out, why, out of the cauldron. Why on earth would you want to eat medieval food? But the variety of the flavours, the colours, the texture, it's, it's like North African food, it's like Southern Mediterranean food, it's vibrant and beautiful and and i think if you do it well and you not to sound arrogant but if you do it properly it is just yeah. joyfully tasteful i think we've, we've made it our mission to yes to, to, to retrieve to, pottage from its bad reputation <laughs> yes. we, 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 people do eat our pottage and, and know, come back for seconds uh so um and yeah. burly fighters who go, I don't eat green things <laughs> happily eat our feasts yeah. and um, with many many green things in yes um and uh, yeah, and, and actually, we should put this one up. This is, this is for me a, a photograph that shows the importance of learning because you have um, Caroline on the left, my mentor. Uh, I'm hiding away in the spit. That's actually her spit rig that we're using there, which is a copy from Bartolomeo Scappi's uh, cooking. And there's Master Paul, and we're actually cooking at um, Queen Elizabeth the First Hunting Lodge in which Epping is in Forest, Epping Forest in North London. Wow. Um, and they we, let us have some venison. Yes, they gave us some venison from the forest, from the royal forest. Uh, so I think we're roasting that in the background, or we're about to. Yes. I think what's, what's on the spit. Actually, the, the the event following year, they also gave us some venison, um, but it was their last venison, and so it meant that the Lord Mayor of London didn't get any. We didn't cook that event; that was done by, was somebody, done by somebody else. else. But so uh, we were always amused by that mm. fact. But this, this is, um, you know, me, this is me learning. From two very very accomplished people um and um i think for me the sea is at its best when this happens and actually this was an sea event and we managed to get caroline to come along to the sea uh and she was pleasantly surprised again about how collegiate and how wonderfully you know everybody just sort of tucked in and did stuff um and you know hmm. it's an important thing to remember um and i think there's a Gosh, I've just written that. Is that? No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, but there's, it's just, this again was sitting in a forest. They wouldn't let us inside the building to cook. We weren't allowed to use their kitchen at this one. They were a bit worried we'd burn the place down. Well, they didn't have a functioning uh, fireplace. So uh, uh, was... Yeah, uh, I think have bats in the fireplace again. Um, but it was a good place uh, to hang out and um, again, talk to the public and interact. And, you know, I think this is the last time I cooked with Caroline. No, let's do it was less than so there was one a bit later yeah, on this but yes. is the last proper time yeah um but paul paul uh, has the distinction of being the oldest king of drakenwald i think um oh. at my laurel uh in my investiture as a laurel uh he um decided he was going to come to the event he doesn't normally come along to crown events he's a bit bored he thought he's going to come along and if he's going to come along he better enter crown you know to something to do and then he started practicing um and he managed to win um, much to his personal well, surprise, I suspect. In his late fifties, um, much to his surprise and his um, his partner's surprise and his consort's surprise and his consort's partner's surprise, um, <laughs> but they they were they were fine. They were fabulous. But he's uh, he's he's a he's a laurel as well. Um, a laurel for doing stuff. Yeah, nobody really knows what Paul's laurel is for. It's lost in the mist of time. But he's an armorer. He's a cook. He's a you know smith. Yeah. Um, uh, a fabulous chap. Yes, so a lot of good people and good memories. In fact, he's also my partner in crime in a lot of things. So oh, one of the wow. things that we made for our camp, you this can is, see the kitchen. This, this is the, do you know what, a cupboard. We need really a cupboard. Really handy if we had a cupboard. Yeah. Because, you know, we've got all these things in boxes, oh, and it's a faff and we're scrabbling and, and, around. You know, we don't want the mice getting in the sugar, you, you know. know. So um, Paul and I had a great time. We were playing around with some books and we found the picture on the left, um, which is of, a, of an ombre cupboard, 
which is a cupboard that you keep your food in, in fact, uh, from the 15th century. And yes, I'm an engineer, so you can see my, um, my, my design. And, and I think we did a pretty good job for two people who can't really cut straight lines very well. Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 creating something, and I should point out, you can see on the right, they're flat packs. Yeah, they're flat packs. It comes Definitely. apart, it's held together with pins. Um, it, it, you have to look at it right and hit it in just the right way to make it go together. Um, but it's, it's it works, it's great. It's had a couple of upgrades. Yeah. It's now got some coloured panels on the front. Um, but it, it comes out accidents. every wagon and it has... It's, it's changed colour. Fantastic for storing spices and you know, yeah. honey and keeping the wasps and the, the mice away from it. Yeah, and um, and, and it's, it's an example of, it's a better picture of it, um, of this is two guys just getting together and making something to, to serve a purpose um, and having a great time of it. And yeah. again, you know. We're not trying to be master carpenters. This um, is a functional this is, and, item. And this is not, you know, reproduction grade this is something that does the job and from you know you don't let the public too close to it because <laughs> next to where we've got our sharp knives going and you know yeah. um uh, it does the job yeah, um it does very well mm. it has to be that high up because when the rain comes yeah we have, to, we have occasionally had floods that have come through this camp you've got to be able to have um, clearance off the ground uh, and also it's very useful that height because you can stuff another box underneath it that is also true uh, <laughs> And actually, when we looked at the picture, it was that was high it was. So, yeah. you know. Um, but we, we, you know. Well, we do all sorts of bits and pieces. Yeah. So I mean, we let the SEA bleed into our, yeah. our, our, our garden, if you'd like. Um, I don't know if you know what these are, but these are things called medlars. Mm. Okay. And they're a 15th century, uh, well, they're very popular in the 15th century. They're a fruit. They're actually very popular in Italy, Spain. Um, I showed this to a, a, a work colleague and she went, oh, yes. And she said what they were called in Spanish. I can't remember. She said, we call them ice cream fruit. But of course, in England, they don't really ripen. Um, you have to put them in a box and stick them in under the cupboard mm. for a week or two to let them go soft. Then you can turn them into a fabulous jelly. Um, so, yes, and we have one of these in our garden. We have we grow these in our garden now along with mulberries and different sorts of, different apples, sorts and of apples and things like that. And wow. So we try. I've experimented, thankfully, with a contact to growing something called Skerrix, which are a proto parsnip. Um, last year, the rain came at the wrong moment and swamped them, so we didn't really get any. But we will try again um, this year. But we'll try again this year because we've got a tiny bit of seed left. Um, so we'll see how we go. Um, but yeah, I, and um, so this is <sighs> this is Eva's other main hobby. So I do, uh, I do embroidery and I, I will say when I initially joined the SCA, uh, I heard about these things called laurels. I presumed, I, I figured to, that I would end up doing more embroidery and, and that probably would be where my path was. The cookery was just something, oh, I just do cookery, that's not anything exciting. Uh, but in fact, actually cookery has grown into being the thing that is, is most of what, what I do. Um, this, uh, on the left was a cushion cover that my sister asked for and it's all done in bay air stitch uh off and the the dragons in the middle are from a 15th century um ark a noah's ark of the different animals that were supposedly on on noah's ark and these were very two fine uh, fantastic sort of griffin dragon things yeah. i'm not sure uh so so this was my project uh, uh, in the autumn whilst i couldn't do anything and uh the one on the on the right is uh, turned into a pouch uh it's uh two phoenixes um and uh from a tile a medieval tile if anybody knows me knows that i love a medieval tile i will wander around places and take photos of medieval tiles quite happily for hours she, and i have a vast collection of photos of medieval tiles you go and, to a medieval building in europe somewhere and she'd be like go oh, oh, find the tiles let's go find the tiles see what's there. oh this has got different sorts of tiles and uh yeah uh it started off because i'm not a great uh drawer i'm, I'm a reasonable copyist uh and the nice thing about medieval tiles is they are a black, white, cream, dark brown, you know, easy to copy. Uh, and uh, so, so it was able, I was able to take designs for embroidery off them. And, um, but yes, it turned into a sort of rather tragic uh, uh, thing of, uh, of, of tile hunting. Tiles. 
<laughs> so there's I have quite a lot. So if you find me on Facebook, my my background is a set of tiles as well. So mm. uh, and other things, I think yes, that's just a close up of the Griffins. griffins. Um, yeah, I'm quite quite pleased with that. Uh, and then a uh, bit of a uh, smocking. I've discovered smocking in the last couple of years. That's quite fun. So I'm going to try and do a bit more of that. Uh, but again, it's quite a nice, uh, easy. You know, the the logic to smocking is once you've got the logic, you can do it for quite a long time, and it's quite enjoyable to do. Uh, so that's an apron, unsurprisingly. So yeah. you've got to have an apron. Um, but that's for best. There's there's the aprons you use when you're cooking and the apron you put on when you're suddenly called into court. Or, or when you're going out to serve. <laughs> or you're going out to serve, you'll think, oh, I better put a clean apron on, yeah. you know. <laughs> so you look a bit more uh, yeah. a bit more presentable, yes. And then, um, and then here's some of the things. Pies, yeah. But... Oh wow. So one of the things I got my laurel for was uh, being good with pastry and good with making pies. And uh, here is some examples, actually, I, I just did a couple of these with, with Egg Bolt, who you saw a photo of earlier. And uh, so we were just experimenting with different types of pastry and things. And these, the one down at the bottom is a, is a pasty. Um, if you've encountered a Cornish pasty, this is what Cornish pasties come from, yeah, or we'll oh, Cornish pasties you eventually turn into sort of the half moon shaped uh, events. And these are large, um, there are depictions of them that are, you know, vast, and it's a way of, of doing something very attractive, which will preserve your meat for many, many weeks. If you've got the seal right, you're not going to eat this pastry, you're going to just, it's a nice thing to have, and then you'll lift it off and you'll eat the meat underneath it and it'll be properly preserved. Uh, up in the top left hand corner, uh, right hand corner, anyway, uh, is <laughs> I found a mold, uh, uh, a modern one, but I thought it was so wonderful, of a chicken, uh, uh, which is of a, 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 a pie mold shaped like a life size chicken. And so uh, for my laureling in, I'm, I'm actually a very new laurel, uh, I got my laurel in uh, autumn uh, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I think I was one of the last of Dracomore before it, it, it went down. Um, uh, I was, because of the way the calendar worked, I was actually cooking my own feast at my own laurel event. So this is one of the things we did, <laughs> which was to make this really fantastic chicken shaped pie. It even had chicken in. Yeah, I still, I, I wanted to have something like, you know, sweet meat or, fish or, something. Uh, fish or something in there to play that lovely medieval something that doesn't look like it is, but but how can you not, love a, chicken, you not like a, chicken a life size mold? chicken shaped mold of pot? It's brilliant. So, you know, so yeah, so um, I do, um, I, you know, I've, I've made pastry for years and years and years and um, uh, being the SCA has only in, increased my interest in different sorts of pastries. Uh, one of my crusades early on was, uh, I was people buying pre-made um, pie dip shells uh, for pies and using them at, at uh, events and then, Short crust pastry is, is so easy yeah. and it's so much nicer and cheaper. And I was like, why are we buying three pounds per pie mm -hmm. when you can do it for 50p? And uh, and so, yes, yeah, so I, I don't, um, I try not to provide and bring any bought pastry into my feasts at all. And I will always make it. And if you're eating a feast of mine, then you can guarantee that there is probably going to be a pie involved. There's probably also going to be pasta involved because I really like making pasta as well. And it's always going to be homemade. And uh, and it's just oh it's just just so much nicer, just so much nicer. What's in the left one? Uh, that was pork mince, and ah. uh, the balls are pastry balls. All right. Okay. So yes, I think it's I think that dish is called flompettes, which is like little flames. It's supposed to look ah, like little flames. Like flame. yeah. So yes, so that's so yeah. I can talk about pies for hours. You could do, but then, but then I can talk about the next topic. But yes, the next really. topic is is Thomas's. So, uh, um. <laughs> I also have another hobby, and in fact, I'm the Kingdom Equestrian Marshal for Drakenwald, and I've cool. been for quite a while now. Um, mainly because there's only five equestrians. Um, <laughs> but uh, as a result, we've tried, uh, we, we've done quite a bit of equestrian over the years, but this is my uh, latest horse share uh, build. And uh, I was lucky that uh, Edith could come down and take some pictures of me in this kit, pretty much um on him and we've done he's uh he's brilliant he he'd never done skill at arms before but he was just one of those horses that got on i went oh 
he'll do this. I picked up a spare and we just went for it. We've done Quintain. Um, but I just started with him um, over the years. Uh, there's a fair bit um, of stuff. We've done, we did experiment with the polystyrene jousting at one point, um, as you can see on the left. And then on the right is some of the earlier uh, equestrian stuff. Um, you can see Master Terrafan in the middle there. He was very keen in getting us going, um, involved. And the picture at the bottom is probably the proudest I've been on, second proudest I've been on a horse, which was, um, I was asked to be involved in a reenactment for one of the local councils, I think, um, and managed to win the uh, skill at arms competition. There's me, um, quite a good uh, strike on a quintain. Um, and yeah, horses are a big passion. I do a lot of it outside of the SEO as well. Um, but uh, I'm hopeful once we can get back to something vaguely resembling normality that uh, we can bring horses much more into the uh, to the SEA here again. And there's still a little, uh, two or three of us from that right-hand picture kicking around um, and uh, doing the question yeah, stuff. And actually, some of, us, some of them now own their own horses as well, so yeah. it's much easier for us to do things. Um, that's all, all, all the pictures we've got. So, you know, oh, do we, oh, we're finishing on chatting now. away. <laughs> um, do you want to show you things? But to if okay. you want to uh, talk to us, uh, now's a good time, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so, you talked a lot about um, reenactment versus SCA play. Um, how is that different for you? The reenactment scene in the UK is very much aimed uh, towards public education. So the different institutions in the UK that own uh, historic buildings, so uh, English Heritage and uh, CADU, which, and, uh, which is Welsh, and Scottish Heritage are funded, government-funded organisations that act sort of as semi-autonomous um, organisations and there is another organization called the National Trust that owns uh, numerous houses and buildings throughout uh, the UK and, uh, and I, Northern Ireland. And um, the point of reenactment is to show the public what the world would have looked like in the past. And whether that is a Victorian cookery demonstration in a Victorian stately home or um, uh, English Civil War uh, reenactments, or uh, medieval knights and uh, jousts and so forth. Uh, so the aim of so what so you see very high quality kit, a uh, very high quality uh, integration. You wouldn't see glasses or anything like that. Uh, but it will all stop at six o'clock when the public goes home. So, that said, it is something that I have enjoyed. Yes, it, they are, uh, and it's they're immensely, different things. But it's a very different thing to the SCA and and. Um, Fortunately for us over here, you can you can easily do both. You can you know, pick it up, and put it down. Uh, but the as I said, that gatekeeping is much higher with a reenactment group, precisely because the reenactment group is putting on a show. Yeah, and they're often being paid in terms of the group gets paid, um, and you know they get to do some amazing things as well so I, I was lucky enough to ride at uh, Hastings 2006 which was uh, about 3,000 a side and 100 horses I think um, the ground shakes in a way when 100 horses canter up a hill that you couldn't imagine and you couldn't do that with, you couldn't get the government funding to do that kind of thing without um, having a level of authenticity that, that you know uh, to make it seem yeah. worthwhile um, and I, I've learnt an awful lot from them. Reenactors are, are really generous people as well as like the SEA, um, but they come at it from a different point of yes. view. And at 6 p.m., they're all down the beer tent, yeah. uh, having a party, dancing to, you know, whatever. Yeah, the disco comes they get on. They a band in. You got, um, you're back in it's civvies different. and it's, it's there, you know? Yeah, it's a different thing. Um, and, you know, I've, I've managed to take some reenactors and bring them to SEA events, Carolyn, and you know, so on, and they get what we do. I'd like to say some of them don't, but most of them do. Um, but they're doing a different thing. And I don't think it should ever be cast as a us and them. Yeah. Well. It's just a different hobby. It's you know, LARP is a different hobby to us. There's a lot of crossover. And I, I think I've always tried to just work with whatever the, the framework is 
to play the games that people want to play. Right. Um, and, you know, I worked for English Heritage for two years running their joust or helping run their joust as a ground crew. And I learned masses and I got to stay in some amazing castles. But it wasn't the SCA. And at the end of the day, you know, I came back and, and you know, um, enjoyed it. So, so the, the, they're different. And uh, what it means is that uh, um, <laughs> the the way it runs is is a different uh thing and um what the british what well what the public in the uk expect therefore is different so when they encounter the sca they presume we are reenactors and uh, when we use some of these sites when we use winchester or Chatao or uh raglan there is an expectation from the bodies that we are using those buildings for that we will have if not quite the level of authenticity but as close as we can make it they understand that we're multi-period they understand that it's not quite the same but they they will expect us to try and conform to some of those standards that they would expect so no obvious you know yeah, plastic just... chairs no obvious uh, you know gas burners and things like that you know they they want you to to hide that yeah. and they want you to but be as authentic very... as you can make it the sites we do use are very welcome yes yeah. oh, they, they, they do understand that there's a entry level and a yeah, and there's a just great ask for and, a balance. So and they ask us to put the plastic tents in a different part of the camp. Right. Everybody expect, understands yeah. that. Um, and it, it gives you a kind of magic feeling. I, I, I think my experiences of, of SEA elsewhere is that when you can do that, if you can have a, I think it's called an enchanted land in, in Lockhart, um, um, there's a certain specialness to that. But at the same time, I understand that there's a there's a gatekeeping yeah. that goes on in that. So you've got to have accommodation for both. There's, there's, but, you know, reenactors are also known for having plastic tents, but they camp around the back with the cars, you know. They, <laughs> yes. they, They're back with the portaloos. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to ask, do you have portaloos at, at oh, yes, the and, and Are they just completely hidden? <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you just, they're down the back. The previous we just, down the back by the woodshed, yeah. actually. The same yeah. everywhere. Yep. So you've got a long walk in the middle of the night. Yes, yep. you do. Yes, you, you get the torch <laughs> out and you and uh, you pray that those we're, we're very those lucky. cobbles that you were that were wet in the middle of the day are slightly. You know, you, you we're very lucky at Raglan. Um, we've managed to get it arranged so that it was always full moon, at least some part. So we've got a good moon up in the night, so yeah. it doesn't because it is dark. in the middle of the countryside, so you don't get much yeah, it's not... light pollution no. from surrounding places. Yeah. It's a really good place to watch meteors. Yes. Oh, the, Ly the lying sky on the rolling is at amazing. Night, watching the sky is one oh. of the special things. Uh, often um, coincides with mm. the uh, one of the big meteor showers, mm. and you just oh, it's wonderful. Wow, that sounds really magical. Um, are there any other differences between playing in Lothok and playing in Dragon Ball that that are pretty? Yes, spiders? I mean the big <laughs> spiders. She says no, no. <laughs> the big difference for me is that Lockhart and, and Australia as a country. I don't know um, New Zealand at all, but uh, um, um, the populations are sort of in clumps and, and lock up. So events can happen in Tuesday afternoon, and you know people are together. Um, whereas in Dragon Ball, we're spread very thinly. Right. We're over the entire continent plus South Africa. Um, and you don't get those workshops on a Tuesday afternoon. You do in some places, but very rare, they're quite small. Um, so when we get together, it's for a weekend and we make it, yes. you know, happen. So you get much bigger events uh, less frequently, I think, than you do say in, in, in you know, uh, you get a weekly dance practice, for instance, but you will get a weekly fighter practice in some places, just not in others. And, and so that distance, um, and I'm told the pandemic has helped some of those mm. fighter practices because a lot of them have gone online. Yeah. People um, who aren't normally able to get to, you know, you know, if you're down here in the south of England, you know, and there's a fighter practice running in Scotland, you know, mm. knowing that you can just turn on that, I think has helped some of our fighters. I, I, I've, I've got that sense that that handy discipline of, of a time mm. when, to, when to do yeah. things. Uh, and the other difference really that comes up and it's what was critical in kicking me over is that interaction with reenactors. Um, the S there are reenactors in Australia, there's many of them, not as many of them. The SCA, in my experience, was a bit more insular from them. So, uh, and, and so when I came over here and I, I had my cotton and my, you know, polyester, and I suddenly realised, oh, hang on, these guys are all wearing wool. And then I realised there was a good reason why they're wearing wool, because the temperature is good 15 degrees lower. Um, uh, 
but I can get things like spectacles. Yeah. The, um, the markets here are fabulous. There's the suppliers for things that, that do are uh, starting to turn up in Lockhart. Uh, I've, it's been 18 years I've been here now, so um, I've played longer here than I have in Lockhart. Yeah. Uh, and I loved it. Um, I often, people seem to think I'm talking lock up down there. It, it's a place that's very dear to me. We've been back yeah, a couple of times. Yeah. The um, availability of traders and suppliers mm. exists because there is a very healthy reenactment community in the UK. So, so as a result, businesses can thrive. So we can, and it, what it means is, is if you are brand new, either as in the SEA or a reenactor, if you need a pewter spoon, you can buy a pewter spoon for five pounds. So what's that, about $8? Uh, you can buy a knife for maybe 10 to 15 pounds. Uh, you can buy a pair of shoes. You, you know, the, you can find the wool, you can find somebody to make the kit. Um, so you can, you need to invest a bit of money, but it's but there it's, and available it's, 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 yeah. for you to go from here to here. In, not, not too difficult. Yeah. But I'd still say the magic is there. There's yeah. still those magical moments of being with your being with your friends, doing the medieval thing, in whatever kit you've got, you know. Um, and I think that in and of itself is a universal thing. We've done events in the West, and yeah. I think we found um, a, a similar welcome and a similar um, um, a similar feeling. I mean, admittedly, we were away on a in, in, a, in, a, in a in a field somewhere. Yeah, um, but it was a lovely field. It and, was beautiful, it was beautiful. Side. Um, and we're so welcome. We still got friends, you know. Yeah. Uh, I did have some contacts because when I was in Lockhart, I was we were part of the West, and I was right. you know Prince Pelagos and so on. Um, but I think so. At the core, there's the same things, but there's there's loads and loads yeah. of differences, and I just it's, think the SCA is different in lots of places, but it stays the same. Yeah. Um, and and you know. People look out for each other and yeah. you know i was so blessed when i moved over i moved to the uk uh on a whim just to follow a job and i came on my own initially um, my then wife joined me later but i found a ready-made community of people who were like-minded and that would have been really tricky if i hadn't yeah um it, it comes back to the reason i joined in the first place um i you know for various mm. reasons my friendship group at the time a lot of them were getting married a lot of them had been moving out of london and i wanted to you know meet more people and make more friends and and i i had always had an interest in history and uh i did history at university and i'm also i had a keen interest in london history and so forth and finding this group of people who i could have those conversations with as well as all the fun social stuff the nights down the pub and the the meals and the chat and the the sunday afternoons doing bits and pieces and then eventually at events you know all of that joy has really enriched my life i met my husband through that uh you know but we were friends before that and you know so dame lynette who you interviewed earlier in the year she emceed at our wedding uh you know um half yeah. the people that we've seen in these photos came and helped and did stuff at our decorated, our, uh, decorated and did stuff at our wedding and we've done stuff oh, at their cool. weddings and their special events and things so it goes beyond yeah. just the fun in the clothes and the events to 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 friendships that are deep and caring and meaningful mm. and that is a, a, a an amazing thing to have found and an amazing thing to found in your 30s i mean that's something perhaps maybe at university you can do that but for me finding that in my 30s was just just wonderful yeah yeah, the sense of community is yeah. fantastic. Um, one of the things that I, I try to ask uh, all of the Laurel guests is um, kind of how long your your path was from when you first started to when um, you became a peer. So I, I started in 1990. Uh, I moved to the UK in 2002 and I I think I became a Laurel 2000. Don't look at me. I can't. I don't remember what the exact date. <laughs> you should have looked it after up. we got married. I think 2012. Yeah. 12, 13, something yeah. like that. Um, lots of changes have passed along the way, so that's good 20 odd years plus for me. Um, and it happened probably yeah. at the right time. Um, I don't know. I can say. Um, but I mean, as I said, I didn't really find my 
my art really until about 2006. Um, I cooked a lot, I'm using, but until I sort of sat down with a campfire and went, oh, <laughs> um, and, you know, started to, to go, I see, and then learned that I can take this to the, the nth degree, um, much to yeah. his dismay on occasions that <laughs> I, you know, he has to rein me in. No, no, I just, yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, it's a good partnership. Um, much shorter for you. Yeah, so I joined, like I said, 2006, and I became a Laurel in uh, autumn uh, 2019. Um, and for me, I think the path was, I think initially, I've always done cookery, and so my path in the SEA is, is 15 mm. years long, but the reality was I have been cooking uh, food and pies and pastries and pastas for many years prior to this so I think when you join when you're a teenager or you you know you join when you you hit university I think you don't necessarily you're not quite as, as formed as a person mm. and because I joined when I was in my 30s um, I already had a lot of core skills mm. so so whilst it's a shorter journey in theory in the SEA time reality was it's still 20 years because that's you know my life as an adult getting skills in in all sorts of different things and whether it's cooking I'm sure I had to learn the medieval food but you know I knew how to put a pie in an oven before that right you had a good foundation <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. but the the niceness of discovering medieval food has been fantastic and and also doing other things the the embroidery and the uh this make failing badly to make dresses and uh you know understanding clothing more in a way that i that i haven't done and, and just recently in in um in lockdown i've started to do some art which i'd never done before and whether that turns into anything sea based i i don't know but it's it's all it it, it opens one up to ideas i think um what have you guys been doing um during lockdown to kind of keep your interest peaked well, I, I mean, I've been incredibly lucky. Um, I have a, a beast in my life that uh, that's Bill. No, that's Bill. Yeah. That's um, that, uh, that 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 needs. I mean, I tried in the first lockdown. We said, no, I probably shouldn't come to the stables, reduce the the risks and whatever. But he he needed the exercise, and yeah. so I, you know, I don't I don't own him, but I share him. And I have responsibilities towards him. So he's been my outlet. Um, I mean, we've also I've also we've both been working continuously yes. our, our jobs didn't stop so we've been working okay. really hard um, well, um, we're lucky to be able to do it from which, home and, and yeah that's um, we feel crazy blessed for that um but uh, yeah for me it's been been the horse yeah and a bit of woodwork um and uh, bits and pieces of embroidery and uh, uh my urge to pickle and preserve things which we haven't really te stepped on but uh, i i do i do a mean pickle have, have also come out uh, uh during lockdown um, she's stressed, I can tell the yes. pickling pan comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Better than chocolate. <laughs> For sure. Uh, so she yeah, doesn't so, eat pickles, she just likes to pickle yeah, things. I don't, yeah, so we saw, you saw the cushion that I did for my sister for, for Christmas and my mother has said she wants one now as well, so I'll probably do that. And, uh, you know, turning to the idea that possibly we will be able to see people, I might try and make another dress and uh, see how that works. So, so generally, keeping oneself busy, but... Uh, not vast amounts of specifically SEA. No, so. it's um, yeah. been tricky that way. But yeah, it's tough. But uh, I've done a few talks. We've done yeah. a few. Uh, there's been see, some uh, see, Zoom events that. Uh, she's been that... keeping a secret. Oh, she's we're actually, talk about that. yeah, she's actually a, a qualified London tour guide. Yes, I am. Um, has the right badges and uh, very quite knowledgeable on the guilds and has uh, done some talks on the, the London guilds. Yes um which uh were well received so you get yourself you know yeah out and busy. yeah so i'm um, the slack one who's just been running away with my pony so <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there's been some fantastic people in drakenwald and in in Strugiconis who are amazing organizers and have put together uh some wonderful online events uh we had a we had a sort of virtual raglan which whilst not raglan was you know really nice to see some faces and there was a uh, virtual kingdom university and uh, well uh, there's a, another one coming up uh to mark uh, a battle, uh the battle of barnet um which is a key one for the wars of the roses uh so all in all and yeah so whilst i'm not going i'm not a poet and i've not 
the person to organize these things i'm i'm always happy to be involved in them yeah and it's it's nice that these these things still happen and and keep our community going in this difficult time yeah yeah for sure um how do you guys uh, see re-entry going do you think that the sca is going to be sort of irrevocably changed by what we've been through or have you really thought about that i can't imagine how it wouldn't be changed but i don't know whether that's the good bad or otherwise um the sca will I, the SEA always changes for me, yeah. always will change. So I can't see how something like this won't change people. Um, I hope it would be a, a change for good. People had a long time to think and miss people. Um, and, um, you know, uh, some people go back to the way they were before. Other people will be irre irrevocably different. Um, uh, I'll probably do different things, but I probably have done different things anyway, so I'm not yeah. sure. Um, uh, Dame Lynette uh, has some tentative plans as uh, Seneschal of uh, Inflodaconis. I hope that they happen. Um, it would be lovely to see people. Um, my last event was in mid-February uh, in uh, the Republic of Ireland, and the, I, the idea of getting on a plane again is an odd thought. Um, I think we'll end up being in our little islands more, I think, It'll be a while before we can go to Sweden or Germany or they can come to us or, you know, we can even travel over to, 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 to the uh, Republic of Ireland. But it's hope. I, I, I have hope because if, if I have no hope, then it's, mm. you know, Pretty cool. then I really am just going to find a rock to hide under and then it's, that's not, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> but at the moment I would settle for a day in a camp, in a, in a scout camp for that, you know. <laughs> Certainly for me, I think people will be a lot more joyful. Yes. They'll be like, we're just doing it. It's great, you know, yeah. and, and just getting on with it. But um, yeah, I can't, I, I can't see it not changing, but change is good. Yeah. yeah. And it may well be that we will lose people because of they've economic hardships things, or they've gone on to do other things or they're still very cautious uh, because of underlying health conditions and so forth. They're worried. Um, and it may be that we find other people. We certainly... I know that people have found the SCA online uh, through this period, and it's to be hoped that they will come and join us in real life and see us see us in the world. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, um, we are at about an hour and a half, okay. right on the spot. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to talk about? No, we've. I haven't. Other than to sort of. To say that you know we just hope that the SEA can be a welcoming place when we can come back again yeah. and that uh, really I, I just you know I love the SEA an awful lot and um, to say thank you to everybody I guess. Yeah it's not a perfect institution but it was never built long, to be perfect. It's a long way from. And striving for perfection I think is yeah. unnecessary because yeah. then it takes out some of the rough yeah. of the joy and the, the mistakes yeah. and uh, yeah. And yeah, I, I think we just miss our friends and we just want to spend some time with people again. And 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 the SEA is that for us. And it has been for, for many years, for all its faults and all its joys. God, that's a bit schmaltzy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I I feel like I'm accepting an Oscar or something. <laughs> I'd like to thank my producers. <laughs> but it's true, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's community and it's family and... Um, we're missing people a lot right yeah now, so. so yeah but it sure. the the niceness of these things being able to happen this yeah. is a this lovely is a new thing that is, i think has been a good thing for the seo yeah. that you, know, you can see how things are different in different places and mm -hmm. and that uh you know we exist yeah and we're still here and we're still hanging the rocks together <laughs> <laughs> and uh you've got a, a, a quite a few comments from uh people who do cookery things in, in uh, on tier uh, that are you know interested in what you're doing so hopefully you can make some connections there too I know yeah uh, I know some people are probably going to try to reach out so um well, I'm happy please, to talk to anybody yeah. and everybody about food <laughs> please send me the link to your uh, website and I will make sure to put it in the comments um, cool yeah. So that we can we can check out that pie oven because it's looking really fascinating to me. <laughs> yes, the the pie oven, the ornery cupboard. Um, some of your menus. Some of my menus, my Winchester feast that I did uh, 
for at the right time at the right place and the the right location is is the details are up there as well so you can see I just can't, might have to ignore some of the mundane horsey stuff but yeah, yeah that's fine horsey stuff comes with the territory for, for thomas i love horsey stuff so i'm not oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Fine. Well, thank you both for doing this. Um, I really appreciate your time. And uh, been very much a pleasure and very easy. Thank you. Yeah. And fun mining for photos as well, actually. That's been yeah, that was actually a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> great, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching. And um, uh, we have three shows coming up this week. Sunday, uh, on Grace Under Pressure, uh, they are interviewing their first male consort, Count Yehuda, from North Shield. So that'll be um, really fun. And uh, Tuesday, I am interviewing Master Charles de Bourbon, um, who has lived in several kingdoms. He does, uh, I want to say, 15th century costuming. And uh, his latest foray is into furrier. Uh, so he's making, um, yeah, but he's doing like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's next level. It's really crazy. Oh, no. and, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, rabbit. <laughs> Wednesday, uh, we're going to have Master Giuseppe from uh, the Kingdom of Kaid, who is also a customer and a cook. So um, that'll be super fun. Um, cool, hope you come and check it out. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good night. Good night.